The immediate priorities are to continue to bed down our Super Hornet capability, which has reached FOC, but we've still got some uh, work to do to introduce some of the final weapons for our Super Hornet capability, such as JCRC-1. Uh, that's, in, that's in the immediate future. The, the next key event will be uh, in mid mid-17, when we, when we will have our 12 growlers back in Australia to stand up six squadron in Australia as a, as an, as a, a complete entity. Um, we currently have multiple uh, individuals in the US Navy system at Whidbey Island and other places in, in the States, in the United States, with our growlers, but 2017 will be a big a key time to bring them back to Australia. And then uh, a year later, a year after that, uh, we'll be bringing uh, a small number of jets and personnel back who were JSF trained uh, to start standing up our JSF capability in Australia at the end of 2018. And then by the end of 2020, uh, we sh we'll be aiming for JSF IOC, which will mean we'll have a full up training unit and one full up operational squadron and we'll have completed two years of operational test and evaluation. So I guess there's three key events over that next three or, uh, four or five year period for Australia. I think the key challenge in getting there will be to continue to deliver uh, our current capabilities whilst uh, transitioning to the new ones. So I think it's uh, fair to say that uh, a lot of forces are under, under pressure. Certainly we've got uh, operations continuing in the Middle East right now and I think one of our key challenges will be to continue those types of operations and delivering capability that government expects whilst we actually uh, transition to the new JSF capability uh, maintain the Super Hornet capability and introduce the Growler capability. Those concurrent activities will be, will be, will have proven and will continue to prove challenging. On the long term vision, well, I think uh, out to the 2030 time frame, uh, I think the, the, well, we believe that our planned acquisitions, which will complete with the delivery of the last JSF around 2023 or so, we'll see Australia well placed out to that 2030 time frame uh, with those capabilities. Um, after the 2030 time frame, I guess the, the two logical options that will be presented in the fighter space will be the utility or otherwise of unmanned combat air vehicles and whether they can actually provide in that 2035, 2040 time, time frame a realistic capability and second of all will be what may be the follow-on lots of people are talking about six generation technologies and things like that now uh, which is interesting because I'm not really sure what they are um, so I think uh, we're, we're feeling comfortable which is a which is a dangerous thing to say I guess but we're feeling comfortable out to the late 2020s 2030 time frame but after that certainly there'll be some other options available that we'll just need to explore over the next 10 to 15 years. Well, from a military perspective, I think uh, it's, a, it's a fairly trite statement, but the, the ability to operate with other countries is key. And certainly uh, one of the challenges I think that we will face into the future will be as we, as Australia for example, acquire, acquires more advanced technologies, the ability to operate those more advanced technologies as part of a multinational coalition will present a new challenge. Not something that won't be solvable, but certainly something we haven't had to worry about. So I'd suggest operating a classic Hornet as we currently are in a coalition environment for Australia will be a significantly different challenging challenge to operating the JSF uh, in that same uh, sort of coalition environment and ensuring that you've got the, rel the relevant um, connections within that environment to make, to make the platforms deliver the, cap the joint capabilities that we need to. Uh, and that also means not only in the air domain but certainly uh, in the joint space making sure that the, uh, that interoperability piece we sometimes focus on air platforms but not only at that it has to be maritime platforms such as our the Australia's introducing an air warfare destroyer with an Aegis weapon system have to be from an Australian perspective interoperable with that type of capability and certainly our land forces uh, as well with some of the new systems the land forces delivering uh, that will be an interoperability challenge let alone just the pure things that fly.